Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Welcome to another edition of the Q Podcast. I'm Gabe Lines, and so glad that you are spending your time with us learning, trying to stay curious, think well, and advance good. And today we're really addressing this question of what does it look like for Christians to be a prophetic minority? Now, this is a term that maybe you haven't heard a lot of. You're used to maybe hearing that Christians are a majority or the moral majority in this country, and yet we know that times have changed. The context, the cultural landscape has shifted. And the question is, what does it mean to be faithful in the midst of that? Well, today I'm so excited to introduce to you somebody that maybe you've heard of, maybe you've never heard a talk by Dr. Russell Moore before, but Dr. Russell Moore delivers a talk on the Q stage that was just brilliant. It's been one of our most popular talks, and we're going to take a few clips from that talk, and then I've invited Russell Moore to join us in the studio to have a conversation about the kinds of things he's saying, and what does that really mean practically for us in 2017? Obviously, with a new president, with a new sort of electoral landscape, with a new conversation happening in media and politics and in many religious organizations and the church, we're living in a moment that's a real crossroads about what does faithfulness look like? How do we as Christians engage as citizens of a state, but also citizens of the kingdom of God? Well, we're going to get into all of those kinds of conversations and questions today, and I hope you'll enjoy it and stick with us. And as we get into this first clip, I'll first just introduce Dr. Russell Moore. He's the president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. They represent the nation's largest Protestant denomination. He's a frequent cultural commentator. You'll see him many times on Meet the Press or in the major media representing how should Christians view either politics or policies or how we're thinking about morality in the culture. Uh, He's written a few books. The most recent is Onward, Engaging the Culture Without Losing the Gospel, and a great leader and a strong prophetic voice. I think you're going to enjoy listening to him. Let's listen in. When I was in college, I had an atheist friend with whom I would dialogue uh, around the clock on the questions of Christianity and meaning of life and the existence of God, and we would debate sometimes late into the night. One day, he came to see me, and he said, I need you to help me with something. I need you to help me find a good Southern Baptist church to join, but one that's not too, you know, Southern Baptisty. My immediate reaction was to say, so you've become a Christian. Uh, well, when did this happen? Well, well we, just, we just talked last night. Well, what happened? I was expecting him to say, uh, in the middle of the night, I just cried out, what must I do to be saved? And I remembered a conversation that we had. It didn't happen. He said, I've decided I want to go into politics. (laughs) And I'm never going to be elected to anything as an atheist, and I'm certainly not going to be elected as an atheist or an agnostic in the state of Mississippi. And as I'm looking through the demographic data, there are more Southern Baptists than anything else here, so can you help me find a Southern Baptist church that won't totally freak me out? Now, my friend was unusual in his honesty, but he was not unusual in his strategy. There has been for many years in this country an understanding that Christianity is a normal and expected way of life in order to be a normal American citizen, a normal person, a good neighbor, a good person in society. Now, as American culture secularizes, there are some things that are changing and some things that are not. One of the narratives that is very popular is that Christianity itself is being eviscerated in this country. That is clearly not true. Christianity is vital and the church is marching onward and upward in this country. What is changing, though, is that nominal cultural Christianity... The understanding that in order for me to be the sort of person that I want to view myself as being, in order to be the protagonist in an American narrative, I must be baptized, that is changing. 
So what we're seeing is a rapture of nominal, cultural, gospel-free Christianity in this country, not a rapture of Christianity itself. What is being taken away is a kind of God and country badge Christianity that sees Jesus as the embodiment of certain values that are being shared rather than as a crucified and resurrected world ruler. As a matter of fact, it's very difficult to argue that Christianity, the way it is communicated in the New Testament, the message of the scandal of the cross, was ever a majority in this country. It was always a word that called the status quo to judgment. But what is gone is the sort of Christianity that can be seen in the Bible Belt, in that roadside strip club that puts Happy Birthday Jesus on the sign outside at Christmas time. The sort of Christianity that coexists with everyday rebellion against Christian moral norms and Christian theological norms with no seeming conflict between those two things. Now, as we move into this new order, One of the most dangerous things that we could do, I think, as the church is to try to normalize Christianity and to try to normalize the gospel. Well, Russell, it's great to sit down with you and just have more conversation. We just listened to this first portion of your talk, speaking to this idea of a prophetic minority. And even that phrase for a lot of people is totally new. Mm -hmm. Um, They're used to hearing words like Christians are the moral majority. You know, Mm -hmm. we see that coming out of the late 70s and 80s. But a prophetic minority is something that's just a new perspective. And yet we Mm -hmm. see biblically this is what the church has always been. Talk always. more about why that's so important for us to maybe recapture this year. You know, I think one of the most important passages in all the scripture related to this is when Jesus says to his disciples, fear not little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I mean, I think that, that encompasses so much. I mean, the idea that Jesus uh, continually gives that uh, it's a narrow way. This isn't, uh, we're, we're not marching through the world with vast numbers and influence, but there's a power there that is different from the power of the world. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I think it's difficult for us to imagine that and to remember that. I think that's the case for Christians at every era, at every place across the world, because we live in a world where power and influence are seen to be so important, whether that's in a family dynamic at a table or whether that's in a a nation or whether it's in a a global dynamic, whatever it is, that that sense of Darwinian struggle for power just is something it's very hard for us to yeah. Unintoxicate ourselves, from. <laughs> right? And I, and I think you know you shared the story of your friend in college, right? Mm-hmm. He was an atheist and, and woke up one morning saying, "Hey, I'm going to become you know a Southern mm-hmm. Baptist for political reasons." And I, right. and I think you know sometimes even in American life that it's even more pronounced this challenge yeah. where faith has become so intertwined with quote unquote American values that it's sometimes difficult to say, hey, I'm, oh, I'm going to be a minority, or, or how would yeah. I even be a minority in American life? Because these two things have become so conflated. Are you seeing that problem growing worse, or are you seeing some, some signs that people are starting to see, hey, we're citizens of a nation, but, but we're, our citizenship of the kingdom actually is our highest priority? Well, I think it's always a difficult thing uh, to understand because we have a tendency to always want to follow our own agendas, uh, whatever those things are, and to to use Christianity or uh, or any religion for that matter as a means to get to what we would already want, uh, even if our religion were not true. And so I think that's the danger that is here. And so, I mean, for instance, you can walk through, a, a friend of mine uh, sent me a picture, he was walking through a mall, and it was a, a kiosk in the middle of the mall that had all of these Bible verses uh, that related to particular sports teams. So Jesus is a volunteer for people who are University of Tennessee or <laughs> uh, you know, all of these different uh, out-of-context wow. Bible verses that were about 
uh, that were about propping up that sports team. Now, of right. course, there's nothing wrong with the sports fandom, uh, and there's nothing wrong, obviously, with those Bible verses. But the Bible verses were a means to prop up the, the more ultimate thing in that context. I think that's always going to be our, our temptation, and we, we have to always be on guard for it. One of the things that's happening with a cultural moment uh, kind of turning against serious Christianity uh, in many ways and confessional Christianity, that actually is a good opportunity to free us from those sorts of idolatries. And the same thing happens in our own lives. I mean, I think um, I can say often the periods of profound suffering that I have gone through in my life, if I look back on them, God was freeing me from some idolatries that I was holding on to that weren't good for me. Right. Uh, and so I think I think as an entire church, we can sometimes see that happen. You mentioned descriptors like serious Christianity, confessional mm-hmm. Christianity. Some have said convictional Christianity. Mm-hmm. I think all the same idea right. that there's a moment where nominal Christianity, the idea that people just sort of raised their hand and said they're right. Christians because that seemed like the expedient thing to do. Maybe it was social pressure, maybe it's yeah. just American values sort of celebration that that said, hey, I, I need to be a Christian if I'm a real American. Yeah. Um, that's one of the great things happening right now is that that divide of, of nominal Christians sort of saying, hey, I, it's no longer socially helpful for me to right. claim the label of Christian, so I'm just going to now be more honest, like, I don't really believe that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so some look on and go, well, this is bad, like we're seeing Christianity in decline in American life. But when we look at the data of like the confessional, serious, convictional Christians, we see that hold pretty steady. Some some would say around 25% of Christians that are holding sort of that line, and we're not seeing it decline. Are you encouraged I'm, by this divide getting a little clearer? I'm very encouraged by it because I think in order to be on mission, we have to have honesty. And so if, if people are in a social context where if I'm not identifying as a Christian, that means that I'm identifying with godless communism in, you know, in the, say, mid-century, mid-20th century, or they're in a context where if I don't identify myself as a Christian, then that means that the rest of the community is saying, your parents didn't raise you right. And so kind of out of family obligation and to belong to the tribe, I need to be part of what it means to be Christian. Well, then Christianity doesn't mean anything in a New Testament context in which uh, Jesus is talking about the necessity of new birth. And so with with people in, in various contexts no longer feeling as though they need to claim to be a Christian, uh, I think that can be a good development. Now, one of the things I'm seeing that's happening that does disturb me and challenge me, is that it seems to me that we don't have nominal Christianity in the Bible Belt right now going away. What we have is nominal Christianity de-churching. And so there was a a time previously when nominal Christians would be people who, uh, you know, would go away from the church, but then would come back to it when they needed it uh, for their their marriage and their children and, and building their family. Now it seems to me that's no longer the case. So you would have people in many, and I'm around many people like this, who would call themselves Christians, who might post Bible verses to Facebook all the time but who don't go to church. Right. Um, that's a very dangerous uh, place to be, both spiritually for the, the people involved, but also, and, and institutionally for the witness of the church, but also for, for entire cultures. Yeah, we, we saw in data we just released uh, through our book, Good Faith, with David Kinneman from Barna Research, 59% of millennials have walked away from the church, walked mm-hmm. away from faith. You know, and that group's now 18 to 35 years old. This is we're right. not talking about just like 22-year-olds. We're talking about people entering adulthood, entering sort of a new season of life who are electing to not participate in the church any longer. And I think that's alarming. And well, and, and not just that, it, it, what I'm seeing at least anecdotally is that the older people, what used to happen is when people came into crises in their lives, they were more likely to go to the church now it's exactly the opposite. Uh, when when people start going through uh, economic difficulties and whatever, they're walking away from the church. Yeah. I want to cut to a clip from this talk on a prophetic minority and for everybody to just listen in on kind of your call to us to consider now what does it mean to remain weird, to continue to be a countercultural presence in this culture. And in the book of Acts... 
whenever the gospel is being preached, the response is not, this sounds like a good way to carry traditional Roman values into the future. The response is, this sounds insane to us. This sounds crazy to us. Of course it does. If we see ourselves as a minority in any culture, that doesn't mean necessarily that we see ourselves as fewer in number. It doesn't mean necessarily that we see ourselves as victims. As a matter of fact, it means we should not see ourselves as victims. It means that we understand that we are living in a time that is not yet the kingdom of God. And so we speak prophetically and we speak as ambassadors and we speak a word that is going to be seen as strange. We speak with conviction and we speak with kindness because we recognize that what transforms people ultimately isn't a set of ideas. What transforms people ultimately is the hearing of a Galilean voice. So we say what Jesus has given us to say, and we don't say anything less, but we say it the way Jesus says it. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We shouldn't be the sort of people who panic and wring our hands when we see a culture that is changing around us. We ought to be the sort of people who are reminded that the advance of the church is not dependent upon the culture. The advance of the church is not dependent upon the government. The advance of the church is not dependent upon polling data. The advance of the church is dependent upon a promise made at Caesarea Philippi, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So when we speak and the outside culture says to us, for instance, on the issue of sexuality, what you're saying sounds strange and, and freakish to us, that marriage is defined in this way and that, and that there are sexual norms that, that shouldn't be violated. Our response is not to back down from that, but our response is to go further to say, yes, we know that's strange, and we believe in even stranger things than that. We believe that a previously dead man is going to show up in the sky on a horse. <laughs> we cannot be a gospel-free outrage machine, and we cannot be a gospel-free affirmation machine we must be those who stand and point, make straight the path of the ways of the Lord and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We don't withdraw, we don't retreat, and we don't vent our rage. We stand with confidence, we stand with good news, we stand with broken hearts, and we say, onward Christian strangers. Let's keep Christianity weird. Well, Russell, you really call us to be weird. Like, this is a good thing. And for many people listening, they go, man, I haven't really ever heard anybody say that, that it's okay to be weird. I've always thought that to be a good Christian, we needed to be relevant. Talk mm -hmm. about that distinctive, like the idea of relevance, which can be a good thing, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's not necessarily a good thing if it's the idol at which we're right. pursuing. So what's that distinctive there between being relevant and being weird? Well, I think the relevance is important uh, in terms of translating to people, uh, this is what we mean and we are talking to you. If that's what we mean by relevance, then absolutely. If what we mean by relevance, though, is let's find those points of connection where people already agree with us and then inch them along uh, toward the gospel, I don't think that's the, the New Testament uh, pattern. I think instead the differentness of the message is what actually brings its power. Yeah. And so that, that means in an American culture right now where everything is so tribal, and so if I am with my people, then I'm with my people on everything. That means that you're going to have an uncomfortable life if you're a follower of Jesus Christ who says, my ultimate allegiance is going to be to Christianity. And that means I'm going to talk about the whole counsel of God in ways I don't 
necessarily want to talk about those things. And I'm kind of scared when we think about those things and when I'm talking to people who see those things as strange and odd. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it because even though it's odd and, and strange, the things that maybe we would pronounce because people haven't heard it before mm-hmm. or they're not used in an individualistic culture to say, hey, we need to actually live our lives by something that's transcendent, that's outside mm-hmm. of ourselves, that calls us to a better way. They're challenged by that, and yet we're doing it because we love them, because yeah. it's for their good. And yet some take that as license to have a tone and a posture towards the culture that seems that it doesn't really represent the way Jesus would engage with an outsider or a non-Christian. Yeah, like, what, exactly. what is your view on the importance of tone and posture, even while stating truth that's quite countercultural? It, what's easy for us to do is to do the exact opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus is gentle, and he's direct, but he's gentle, and Jesus is very sharp with those who are on the inside and who are claiming to represent God in ways that that God uh, has not uh, given uh, to them to represent him. Uh, The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5, I do not judge outsiders. The outsiders have no accountability to me. It is those on the inside that I judge. The easy thing to do is to just reverse those things. And so we have a very gentle sort of tone uh, about whatever are the issues that are going to be sensitive within within whatever our Christian context is. And then we have a very sharp uh, and angry tone toward those who are on the outside. And why? Because we're not really speaking to those outsiders. Uh, instead, we're speaking to the other people on the inside as a way of signaling, see, I'm really with you. And yeah. those people are bad. That's not the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we think about the next generation, I think there's there tends to always be great concern about the next generation. We've seen sort of a steady decline of them being less participatory in church, mm-hmm. holding to their faith the way maybe their parents did. Mm-hmm. And we always hear we're only one generation away from kind of losing that entire generation in a way that they don't understand what the gospel is or the witness and what it calls us to. Mm-hmm. We know we can trust God for that, mm-hmm. and and yet we have a role to play in that. I was talking to the president of a one of the largest Christian universities in the country, and we were both reflecting on how we find the freshmen that are coming into colleges who are coming out of Christian churches when they're hearing some of like orthodox Christianity in these environments, they're sopping it up. I mean, like a sponge mm-hmm. going, yeah. I haven't heard this. Like my right. youth pastor's not telling me this stuff. I've never really heard my parents talk about some of the things we as Christians believe and why it actually can lead to my neighbors flourishing mm-hmm. um, and, and how it actually does relate to my role in the world. And it's actually really refreshing. I don't know if a lot of our listeners would know that. They might think, man, younger Christians just aren't that interested in this stuff. And I think the opposites... True. We, is true. Are you yeah. seeing that? Absolutely. What what I'm not seeing are, are the kind of middle group of people. When you go into a typical college campus, you're going to find people who are secularist, and then you're going to find people who are seeking to be committed Orthodox Christians who are in touch with the full body of Christ, which means the body of Christ across time, uh, the body of Christ in heaven as well as the body of Christ on earth. So I'm optimistic about the church, and I mean the church globally. Jesus is going to build his church. That doesn't mean I'm necessarily optimistic about the American church. I think that's a very fragile thing, and the American church could, of course, completely collapse, but God will always have a church, even if that is a church that is sending international missionaries into North America. Yeah, and I think you're right, and I think I would have that same perspective that things might look a bit worse in the years ahead in terms of a decline of sort of what we've come to think of Mm -hmm. as the American church, but ultimately it's going to produce a fruit that's beautiful, that's faithful, that's convictional, and that actually points a way forward. And I think like you, believes people will look at it in a lot of ways and say, oh, that's kind of odd and curious and maybe be interested in it. But we're not doing it only for that reason. We're doing it because this is what faithfulness requires. Let me just a quote that Beth Moore recently stated that sort of received a lot of attention. I'll summarize where she basically said, you'll see in these times that there will be some Christians who will essentially 
believe so much in Jesus and the love of Jesus that they're willing to step aside from Scripture Mm -hmm. in order to love people the way Jesus would love them. And and I think she was really pointing out one of the dilemmas we're seeing inside the church now, that Mm -hmm. the kinds of place you mentioned that Jesus had some of the sharpest criticism for those who claimed to represent him but weren't really representing him. I see more and more divide happening inside the church around these discussions, and I think people are looking for ways forward, like how do we get along? Are we supposed to get along? How do we navigate these tricky waters when we see brothers and sisters that it seems are stepping away theologically from what the scriptural authority and interpretation historically has always been on key issues like sexuality and others? Mm -hmm. Beth is exactly right, that there is this uh, tendency right now to say we're either going to go with truth or we're going to go with grace and we're going to disconnect them from one another. And I think the reason that that always happens is fear. Because if you come with the message of Jesus Christ that is full of truth and full of grace, so you love people and you confront people, but you confront people with reconciliation in view, you're going to receive blowback from both directions. You're going to have people who are going to say, why in the world would you come in and say to tax collectors to repent? Uh, leave us alone. Don't come to Zacchaeus' house. And you're going to have people saying, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? What does that say about him? And so the fear can cause us to do one or the other. We either just morph into the culture itself, or we spend all of our time making sure that everybody knows that we're not approving of those who are on the outside in a way that we never take the mission to them. She's exactly right. I want to invite you to come out Friday night to watch the film Silence. It's an incredible film by Martin Scorsese. His movie is not only a magnificent work of art, but it's probably one of the most timely of all the Oscar-nominated films. Time Magazine calls it beautiful and illuminating. Vox is saying it's one of the finest religious movies ever made, and even Paste is raving that it's one of the most richly layered, faith-driven narratives you're likely to encounter in modern cinema. Well, you can also win free tickets to see it Friday night at Screen Brew. Dot com, and we're asking everybody to use the hashtag See Silence Friday and just be a part of a new discussion. It's a perfect moment. We'd love for you to be a part of it and check out more at screenbrew.com. This has been another edition of the Q Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed getting to hear these different perspectives and conversations. I hope it's challenged you to just keep going deeper, keep asking questions. Keep looking for information that just helps you be well-informed. You know, today we have so much information, it's really hard to filter down. What should I listen to? Who's right? Is this fake? Is this true? Is this real? And so our goal at Q is to be somewhat of that filter for you, to help you uh, as you're in your busy life and you're going along and you're driving to work or maybe you're on a walk or exercising, that, that you'll actually have the opportunity to listen, to consume some really good information, but that you'll also be inspired to think well about how you're engaging today's culture. And so join us, as I said, April 26 to 28, 2017. We're going to be in Nashville, 2,000 leaders coming together to engage 35 topics from our stage and then many more in our panels and breakouts. But more important than that, you're going to actually meet people who share the same kind of vision you do about life. You believe that Christians ought to be leading in these conversations. We ought to be contributing to the way our world is viewing some of these really complex topics. So join with us and actually learn more about it at QIdeas dot org slash two zero one seven that's qideas.org slash 2017 and you'll find information there regarding the experiences the different panels we're doing the after parties all of the opportunities to connect with one another over meals and so on and we're gonna have a great time and i hope you'll join us i hope you'll bring a friend but until then i look forward to joining you again on this next episode of the q podcast <laughs>